Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 329 for Monday, December 13th, 2021. folks and welcome to gig gab or welcome back to gig gab if you're already a member of the family the show by for and about working musicians sponsors for this episode include and are ultimate ears where we have our custom url which is custom.ultimateears.com slash gig gab and there's all kinds of holiday promo deals happening we'll talk about the specifics of those shortly here for now here enjoying what's becoming colder weather and winter season in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's budding songwriter, Paul Kent. <laughs> oh, there you go. I like it. Have, how has that been going since good. you brought you know, it up? Again, oh, that's good. Again, more, uh, more uh, looking for music ideas, more yep. just jotting brain stream of consciousness lyrics down. Sure. I'm reading Steve Van Zandt's book right now. You know, Steve Van Zandt is the... Uh, he, he played with that Springsteen guy. Right. Longtime friend of his. And it's funny because he talks a lot about songwriting. He's written a lot of songs for other people. Yeah. And they, they talk about knocking out songs in an hour, you know, on, and I'm like, what? <laughs> you did what? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, but I think it's a thing once you get in that groove and your brain is accustomed to, you know, formats and phrasing and you know you you can you know communicate things from your imagination through your brain into your hands into your instrument out of your mouth you know i guess there's a flow where it's easier for some than it is for for others so i have uh, i said that i've been very very fortunate to spend a good portion of my life working with and around some spectacular songwriters and that includes to this day uh and and you're a hundred percent right. I've I've seen people just like barf out a song, and and you know it's like okay, and then you kind of you know you get it down, and then and then maybe you massage it from there. But some of the world's best songs, the some of the world's most popular songs, I, I'll, I'll I'll take the any judgment out of them. But some of the world's most popular songs were written in a you know in a very short period of time even as compared yeah. to other songs written by those artists you know a, a favorite for me is Rush's Tom Sawyer which was not part of any of their pre-production writing rehearsals or anything the 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 lick that we all know is that that you know da -da 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 -da, that whole thing that uh, around the the whole motif around which the song is based was a keyboard warm up thing for Getty Lee just to, you know, make sure his keyboards were working and his fingers were working and all of that. And they had intentionally carved out one track for that record, Moving Pictures, which was going to be composed entirely in the studio. They otherwise would do, you know, grueling, countless hours, days, weeks, even of pre production work where it was just the three of them writing songs and, and working it out for days and days and days on end. Uh, but they would always leave room for studio inspiration. And that song was studio inspiration. Um, right. So, you know, these things happen and they can work out really well. It can also be total utter crap, um, you know, and, and that's okay too. And I think, well, you know, maybe that's my advice for you having, again, I'm, I am, I am not an experienced songwriter, but, 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 you know, I have experience with songwriters and the whole process you just described, I, I, I would say, the advice that I would give to you or anybody is get out of your own way. Just let it come out. And, and then, then afterwards judge it, but don't judge it as it's coming out would be my advice. Well, the, you know, the funny, the couple of funny things. One is I was somewhere last week. I was at a play or something like that. Sure. And uh, a phrase or a melody or something came in my mind and now that I'm thinking about this, it's a huge part of my headspace. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh, crap, I got to get this down. I got it, yeah, right? And, but yeah. I'm, I'm in a darkened theater, right? And I'm not to the point yet where I would make my wife ticked off at me and say, I got to go out in the lobby for a second and get this down. So <laughs> I, I, can, I can imagine this, that's coming. But literally that, um, you know what? You know that, um, that, that app called Evernote? I do. I use it uh, a lot. Yeah. Well, 
you know, my, I'm starting to be the Evernote of songwriting ideas. Just anything that comes to my mind, a phrase, an interesting thing I see, you know, I, I'm trying to just kind of get down and then, then I spend a little bit of time going back and organizing it. Um, so anyway, th- that's part of the progress. And the other part of the progress is two really interesting things. One, uh, thinking about, again, Get Back, the Beatles doc that we've been talking about, you know, and how McCartney just sits there with ideas, you know, strumming a a uh, a melody on his bass actually playing playing chords on his bass or at a piano sure and you know just looking for a melody and then once he has that he'll fit words to it afterwards and then i found another thing that guy i like springsteen there's you know there's a there's a lot of interesting material out there of springsteen of his of his outtakes or you know when he did the album nebraska which he did in his bedroom on a on a little tascam four track there's a lot of outtakes from that as well and again it's the same thing chord progressions singing, look, looking for a melody, and then going back and, I guess, you know, going back to the notebook and seeing what lyrics you have and seeing which you can fit to which. So What's there? I, yeah, I guess- exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, first of all, it's interesting because, I I mean, we I lived it certainly as a kid, but to think, oh, he recorded it in his bedroom on a four track, whereas now we talk about, you know, well, in my, in my bedroom and yours and literally <laughs> everyone else's, we have a, you know, 64 track recorder at our fingertips at all times. You know, it's just funny how technology has, has changed and really opened things up. Not necessarily Better or worse, though, I think we can argue that there's probably more good from that than bad. Although, you know, having to bounce tracks around on a four track, you know, we would record things and then bounce them and bounce them and bounce them. And and once you bounce something, it was permanent and forever. And, uh, you know, that that part, especially like my in my high school and college bands, uh, but the high school band, especially where we also had some fantastic songwriters and some of the best songs that I've ever been a part of seeing been written or, you know, crafting, uh, you know, you'd come up with something, you'd, you'd work it and then commit it. And, and that lack of freedom that the four track imposed where it was like, okay, the drum track is now down. Now we're bouncing the bass track and the, and the drum track to, and maybe even the guitar track, we're going to mix those and, and bounce those to the fourth track, right? You record three bounce those to the fourth. Now, that mix is set in stone forever and you don't get to rethink it. You don't get to say, Ooh, I'd like to go back and, you know, touch and rub that one little snare hit so that it's later or make it a little louder or softer. Even it is what it is. And then you put the vocals on and then you might even like bounce the vocals with those rough tracks over so that you have room for solos and harmonies. And you're constantly bouncing this stuff back and forth and back and forth. And that forced the process forward. You could not look backwards. And, and there's something to be said for that, you know, um, but, but it's, you know, it's how it, it's how it goes. It's, um, I've, I've had, I, I've had what I'm calling my 2112 recordings. Um, it started that, that phrase started when I was in the studio with Bitter Pill a couple of weeks ago because it's December of, of 2021. So, uh, I call them our 2112 recordings, which, you know, the, the band laughs at me about, uh, but, uh, but they aren't the only recordings I've been doing this month. I, I, the Friday we set up in for bitter pill Thursday afternoon, we went in and started our sessions Friday afternoon before I went down. I had gotten a call from my friend, Amanda, who had said, I need, um, drums. I'm putting together a Christmas album. I'm like, wow, it's already December. Like you got to get this thing out. She's like, I need drums for, uh, run, run Rudolph, which I, a- after researching it, I realized I've been calling it the wrong song all these years it's run rudolph run i believe is the Uh, correct name of that tune but but he sings run run rudolph he does he sure does yep (laughs) uh but he sure does does, which is why we all call it that but yeah run rudolph run is is the name of the chuck berry song and uh so there you go there's your musical trivia so it was like okay and i i said to the uh, nevin who our friend who's recording it and engineering it for him like great you know what like, I'm not going to have time to come into your studio this weekend, but I have time like literally right now in my studio where I can record drums, multi-tracked and just send you the stems. And, uh, and I'm like, so just send me an MP3 and the, and the metronome marking and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll bang it out. Like it's a pretty straight, straight, straight ahead tune. He's like, yeah, there's no click track on this. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah, but I've, the MP3 has everything except, you know, no click and no vocal. <laughs> I'm like. 
Okay, so I have no idea whether I'm playing under a you know guitar solo or a vocal or what. And but the guitar solo was on there, so I was like, all right, everything else is a vocal. Great, I guess, unless there's some musical interlude I don't know about. And it was like, well, okay. And then the end of the tune was this it, the, the the you know the groove is done whatever. And then it was like, but stopped. There was a period of undetermined length. And then the band comes in with bum, 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 you know, the, the blues outro. I'm like, mm -hmm. they need a fill into that, don't they? From the drummer who has no idea how they're counting any of this and doesn't really have time to find out. So I, I came up with my own way of counting it. I played it through three times as I always do in the studio. And, uh, and one of them, I nailed it. Just, you know, dumb luck. Uh, cause, cause there I was, there would, it would stop. I would count the way I thought I should count. And then I would, you know, out of thin air, just play brat, boom, boom, and hope that when I hit the one, there it was. And one it was time, there one, yeah. it was there one time. It was like, great. That's the ending that we're going to be using. And now let me slice and dice the, the, you know, the best of these other three, the one, the parts where I'd actually followed the, the wavering tempo of, of this, this track that was not clicked at all. And it worked out fine. And the record's out. It's all good to go. But I did that on Friday and then on Monday. Actually, I have a whole story to tell about this fling track that I've been fighting with. But, but like, we get to do these things now. And, and so there is this freedom of the creative process, which I think is pretty cool. Mm, cool. All right. I don't know. Like, it's, it's fun. Yeah, this, um, did I step all over you? Did you have more to say? Nope. Okay. No. Nope, nope. Okay. Um, this fling track, it's a song called Five Days. Uh, we've been trying to get our, uh, you know, a, an EP of sorts out and we've, you know, one by one sort of painstakingly been going through these tunes, recording it. We'll call it remotely. There's been, you know, some stuff done in each of our homes and Russ is doing the mixing. I'm doing the kind of, well, I'm doing the drums and the mastering and, uh, and we're pulling these things together one by one. You've seen, if you've, if you've seen them, that we've put out some videos of, of the songs as they've each kind of been finished with the process and there's this tune five days that um, Fling has been playing for, let's say, over a decade. And I think I've played a different drum groove in the verse every single time. Like, I don't I, I don't I didn't really think about it, but I never really had a part that I felt like locked in. Sometimes a part would lock in, but the same part never locked in twice. And it used to be a song that I would sing. So there was a lot else going on, uh, but it's got this weird kind of, uh, you know, Middle Eastern flavor to it. It's got a weird rhythmic riff that, that sort of drives the tune. And so on Monday I was like, we got to get this done. Russ was really frustrated. He's like this track, you've had this track since February. I'm like, yeah, but it's like, I'd put down some rough things to it, but it just wasn't right. I'm like, all right, let me, I, I like, just come off the weekend of in you know in the studio with Bitter Pill, and so it was like all right I like I'm in this creative mindset I'm I'm letting myself you know trusting myself to just play or whatever, and so I played you know the track probably another few times maybe more than a few, and came up with two different there's two verses that are, that have drums there's one verse where it's just you know guitar is sort of the intro of the tune, two verses the drums and I came up with two different parts for them, either as sort of an experiment of which one do we like, or maybe this song needs two different parts to sort of propel it forward. And I put them down and did a little rough mix and, you know, shared it with the, with the band. And Russ was like, hmm, I don't know. I kind of like the part that we've been working with since February, but I know that that doesn't really lock in either. Mm. And it was like, yeah. And we started getting, you know, it started getting, I wouldn't say we were fighting about it, but we were all clearly frustrated. Like, shoot. And I know it's on me, right? Like it's, you know, and it's like, yeah, but it's like, I've never, it, and it started, I started to think we should not have, this song has never felt finished to me. We should not have put it on the, the list of songs that we felt were finished enough to record because there's other songs that are sort of in the same state that we decided are not part of this phase of things. You know, we'll, we'll let them germinate a little more and, and, and try, you know, them for the next round or whatever. And we, you know, for whatever reason, it was decided that this was one of the five or whatever that's ready to go. I'm like, I don't think it's ready to go. I don't think it's ever been ready to go. Uh, and, and, and I'm just now realizing that, like, if you had asked me in February, I would have said, yeah, it's ready to go because I thought it was, but it's not. And so going through that though, 
kind of gave me freedom to be like, all right, well, there are no sacred cows here. This song's not ready to go. Everybody else has recorded their their parts, and most of them are good. It's It could be argued that maybe the bass part also needs to change because th th we just don't know what the groove of this song is. So maybe that bass part's fine, but maybe it's not. Like, we just don't know. But, you know, giving... So I asked Russ, I said, hey, man, send me a mix that has no bass. And he had this tabla kind of uh, ostinato thing running through parts of the song, including the verses, the, the problematic sections. And uh, I'm like, you know, maybe the tabla is like throwing me off or or not letting me be, you know, free enough with ideas. And and let's get the bass out of there for for me and just send me an mp3 with with those so i can i can experiment and track to that and um as soon as i asked him to take the tabla out like th it like that was the moment where ideas started to germinate it was like oh but wait maybe when he put that in there he was on like he has an idea and so it became this sort of detached collaboration thing which uh which was it was pretty cool and I sat down the other day and was like, all right, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to try. This was on Friday. I'm just going to try some ideas and whatever happens, happens. And it's fine. And for the verses, I, I came up with this, um, like Tom pattern. I'm like, you know what? The verses aren't allowed to have snare drum. The verses aren't allowed to have symbols. Let's just try this and see if this idea that, that Russ sort of, you know, peppered in there with this tabla thing, maybe that's the way this should go. And uh, so I came up with actually two different patterns. I don't know if anybody in Fling realizes this, um, but the each verse is different. And I think it works to have it evolve. One verse is a little more complex than the other, just slightly. And I think that helps to kind of propel things along. So it's not feeling like we're going back to the verse prior. And uh, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I kind of like this. And then I mixed in the bass track that that we had. And I'm like, actually, it works really well with the bass. And it even worked with the rhythm of this tabla part, although I think the tabla will probably not be a part of the the final thing. I think he did his job, the little our little tabla <laughs> friend. He he inspired us in the appropriate ways, but I, I think it's just a little too much motion happening to have this extra thing in there. And uh and so I sent it to the band on Friday afternoon. I'm like, okay, here it is. A mix with tabla and without, but but with the bass, because it the bass track definitely pulsed at the right points and you know worked and it was fine. Even though I, I didn't found it. Even though I didn't record with the bass, like it was perfect. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, exactly. Basically just playing along with guitar and vocal effectively. And uh, I sent it off to band and I'm like, I wonder, like, does it, does anybody else like this? You know, was my, sort of my question, but I just threw it out there and Russ wrote back and he's like, finally, he's like, this is what this song needed. I'm like, okay, we're all in agreement. We, I found it. Yeah. But it was, but it, I don't take full credit for it. Like, I, I mean, I, it was bullheaded persistence that got us through, but it was definitely the collaboration of all of those pieces, including 10 years of it never being right. And me knowing what rhythm I wanted to play, but not knowing what surfaces I wanted, what instruments I wanted to play these rhythms on. I, I just had it in my head that I needed to be, you know, kick snare hi-hat kind of thing for the verses. And once I freed myself up from that, th like everything came together. I was like, yeah, okay. But like- it, it it's a good uh, creative exercise that you came into it from a different perspective, though, right? Totally. Like you, had to, you had to work and work and work to kind of free yourself from your preconceived notions, and then you let creativity kind of seep in and solve the problem. Frustration, but sure, let's call it creativity. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, but that's like that's you're a hundred percent right. Like that was it. But but it's like that's the thing about about the creative process is you 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 don't always get to choose when you are going to be successfully creative although the more you do it you know like anything like practice helps because the more you practice being creative and just letting yourself do stupid shit like that, yeah. that you know whatever that is as long as you let yourself do that and give yourself freedom to for it to be awful like i was looking at at the the tracks on this i have recorded i have kept let me put it this way i have kept i think 23 different drum tracks takes for this song. And there have been th now three completely separate comps where you take the takes and like mix them together into here's a part. Right. And, yeah. and, and so if there's been 20, if there's 23 in there, 
I know that I've gotten halfway through the you know first chorus and flubbed something and said, well, never mind, and stopped it and un and, you know hit undo. So there's probably 35 takes that actually happened to get to this point. That's a luxury that is only afforded by me doing this at home. Uh, it, you know, if if that were if we were you know even go back to Bitter Pill in the studio, you know, a couple of weeks ago. We were able to be very creative and free in the studio, but to let one person take 35 cracks at a tune, uh, like that would be and have been a waste of our money and time, you know, or a, a not wise way to spend our money and time. We would not have let that happen. We would have, you know, it would have been, dude, you got to live with, with this being slightly less than exactly what is right for this song or, or, or punting on the song or whatever. Like there was other things to do. You got to move on. And so, this this idea that in our bedrooms or wherever we can do that multi track recording and and make it sound pretty good and and the freedom to do it all and to collaborate remotely and all of that stuff is it's amazing and it really does open up the creative process and it it's a I mean yeah we're putting out these things and so it, it it's a means to an end but the whole the journey is the reward on this stuff for for us, like we're not expecting this new fling EP that we're putting together to, you know, fund our collective retirements or anything. Like, you know, it's a, it's just a project. It's a labor of love. Right. Uh, but it's also an exercise in creativity. And I mean, exercise in, in the very traditional sense, we are just flexing those muscles to get better at flexing those muscles uh, in many ways. And we are getting better at it. Like the, the sounds of this one are so much better than what we did last time and the, the way it's all coming together. Perfection can be the enemy of, of release, of course, um, because, you know, you wait until you have it all perfect and then you get one track perfect and you move to the next one and you get that perfect. And you're like, wait, but I know more now. I could go back and make the first track more perfect. That's dangerous <laughs> or not, depending on what your goals are. <laughs> but it's fun. So, yeah. Yeah. Enjoy the, the journey is the reward. The journey is the reward. That's, that's really it. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a blast. So I've been having fun with it. And you know, the whole time, Paul, I've been wearing in the studio with bitter pill in here in my studio, uh, when I was recording the fling stuff and the, um, the, the Amanda stuff, I've been wearing my ultimate ears pros, my custom fit. Wise choice. Very I know. Choice. And I'm happy they're our sponsor this week. They, they know what we musicians need. Uh, they've been doing this a long time. They were, you know, right there at the beginning of the whole in-ear monitor realm. They've been doing this for over 25 years. And there's a good reason that they're, you know, an essential tool for all of us. Uh, and you use them. I use them. Fantastic. Reliable. They you just put them in. They sound good. Their service is fantastic. And they've got... Deals, big time deals. They've got deals site wide up to 650 bucks off of UE Customs. It's their best deal of the year. You get uh, $360 off the UE 11s, which are what I use, $450 off the UE 18 Plus Pros. And I said 650, I meant 660 off of the UE Live Pro. Uh, that's what they've got here for me to tell you. It is fantastic these are the deals you want to take advantage of and of course you can use our link custom.ultimateears.com slash gig gab and of course we put that link in the show notes just in case you forget it because you're out like driving your car home from a gig or whatever it is and and using that you get 20 percent off if you wind up buying something that's not part of the holiday promo with code gig gab 20 so yeah you got to go check this out it is fantastic stuff again it's custom.ultimateears.com slash gig gab and go check them out great stuff i know you're gonna love it and our thanks to ultimate ears for sponsoring this episode it's good stuff um paul on the on the hardware front i have been uh eager to play a gig where i need to mix ourselves because i've been working with this new um mackie mixer the dl32s I've been a big fan of, of Mackie mixers over the years. I've been using the DL1608 since it came out, which was like six or seven years ago now. 
that was the first of the really the first of the the mixers you could use an iPad with. And uh, that's a 16 channel mixer. This is the this 32S. It's a 32 channel mixer. It's got uh, 16 XLR only inputs and then 16 combo inputs where it can be XLR or quarter inch. So you got lots of flexibility, 10 XLR outs. So you can configure those any way you like to for your in-ears, for your stereo in-ears, for your mains, your stereo mains. And it's got built-in Wi-Fi, which I haven't tested yet. I've heard some people tell me that I probably should bring a separate router to the gig just in case yeah. the built-in Wi-Fi isn't strong enough. Uh, and I, like I said, I, I got this thing uh, back in October, so I haven't had a gig to use it at yet, but I will have a spare, um, a spare router in my, in my bay. But to, you know, th this thing, I, like I said, I, I've been a big fan of the, the Mackie stuff over the years. The, um, it originally started that you could only use Apple devices, iPhones and iPads to control it. Now with the, the, the way they've done everything, you can use Android, you can connect over the, you know, with a computer, there's apps for the Mac and Windows, and so you really have a lot more flexibility, which is great for those in-ear mixes for all the bandmates, because like even in Fling, not everybody is on an iPhone, which seems strange to me, but Russ is not an iPhone guy, and that's okay. He can use Master Fader on his, uh, on his, on his Android device, and he'll be you know just fine. I don't have to mix his ears for him. So I, 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 I'm a big fan of you know, the, the whole concept of a, uh, you know, of a, a digital mixer that's yeah. controllable and you can save all your settings and all that stuff. And like I said, the Mackie stuff has worked. I've, I've used a bunch of them over the years. I, the Mackie stuff has worked really well for me over the years. I'm, I'm stoked to have this one. And this thing is tiny, man. Like it's smaller than the, the 1608. It's just built as a stage box, right. uh, which is, which for, for what I generally do is perfect. Uh, I don't need space taken up by faders that I'm not going to use. You know, that can all be on the iPad uh, and, and it works. It, you know, it can just sit there on the stage and it seems pretty rugged. Like I said, I haven't beat it up, taking it to gigs or anything yet, but I feel pretty good about it. So I think Mackie stuff, so something happened with Mackie, you know, some amount of years ago where their stuff went from kind of like Behringer, like consumer -y, what Behringer was like then too, but, but yeah. Behringer has gotten way better as well. But Behringer and Mackie both really like strong pro in the computer world. We call it prosumer, right? Would, yeah. you, would you say that that's what this is? Yeah, I think that's probably fair. It, you know, it's built exactly for, for us, the weekend warriors, right? You need something yeah. to be reliable. You don't need, you know, the pro touring, stuff that, that, you know, that somebody playing stadiums is going to be using. You just need something that you're going to be bring to a gig. It's going to sound good. It's going to work. And, and you're going to be, it's going to be easy to use like that. That's what I, that's what I want. That's what I need. And that's what, yeah. Mackie delivers for me for sure. Yeah. 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 And I like the idea when this, when the, when the deal, when I first got the DL 1608 and I started going through it and like thinking, how am I going to use this tool you know, differently from how I used an analog mixer prior to that. And the idea of being able to set up gain structure for each, you know, musician's input that really doesn't have to change much from gig to gig. The EQ of the overall PA, yes, like you've got to tune that to the room that you're in. But as long as you've got that same singer on that same microphone plugged into this channel at every gig, no matter what, you can start to get a whole lot pickier about what that gain structure looks like. You you can say, okay, well, I know that this is where I need this set. I know, you, you, I, you know, the luxury of putting a compressor in on every vocal channel is just preposterous when I think back to the analog days, <laughs> you know, but to be able to do that and say, yeah, as long as it, you know, it's, it's that singer on that microphone, then great. I can dial in this compression to be just perfect, to, to give them a nice present tone without it pumping and hissing and, and, and all of that. And then, you know, even EQ and everything to just get it all together uh, on the, you know, on the channel, the right, knowing how much, what percentage of the overall delay or what per percentage of the overall reverb, the effects you're going to assign to those channels again, then in the room, 
you sort of overall say this room needs more reverb, this new room needs less reverb, we need more delay here, the monitor's less delay, whatever that is, you know, you 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 start with this foundation where you don't have to, you know, build it up every single gig. In fact, you can iterate from gig to gig if you realize, oh, wait, you know, relatively speaking, there's too much reverb on the, you know, on the guitar or on the snare drum. Okay, great. You bring that back. Now, and you save it, and the next gig, you're good to go. And I know I'm talking generally about any digital mixer, but it, it really does make a difference. And, and like you said, the Mackie stuff is, I mean, it's proven to been re- to be reliable for me. I've, I've been using their speakers um, and their, you know, their mixer for for years, and it's just great. So, I, like I said, I'm worried a little bit about the Wi-Fi in this thing from what I see on the forums and all that. The, I love the idea of having built-in Wi-Fi. I don't like the idea of not being able to trust it but yeah. that's just how it seems to be. <laughs> yep. We, we travel with a, we travel with our own router. It, does your mixer have built in? Um, yeah. We have that Midas. And it has built in Wi-Fi. I didn't think those did. I thought they just had an ethernet port for an external mixer. I'm pretty sure they nope. don't have built in Wi-Fi. Yeah. Which is, which is fine. Like, but, <laughs> yeah. It, it must cause Bill, Bill mixes from a, from an iPad. Uh, Right, because you because you attach your external router to it. I th- oh, I see what you're saying. I say I'm sorry. I'm I'm being dumb here. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's just a. It's not. It's not a, a router built into it. It's a. Correct. It's a. It's an Ethernet port. Got yes, it. it's an Ethernet port. Yeah, right. So this Mackie one has an Ethernet port, but it also has a built-in 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi radio. And people say you can make it a little better with the you know with a bigger antenna, but. Adding that five gigahertz signal in some places m- makes a big difference if there's a lot of you know Wi-Fi noise happening. Uh, right. So, I I like I said I you know me I bring lots of spare things to gigs. So I guess now having a spare router until it proves that I need that as my main router because that, <laughs> that's sort of the way to go. The, yeah, um, no, I get it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The old one, the sixteen oh eight had. It was the form factor of it was such that you would slide an iPad into it. And so even if the Wi-Fi like completely fritzed out, you still had a way of controlling this thing with this. There's no way unless you have, you know, some sort of network device connected, either Ethernet or Wi-Fi. So it's a little more it's a little more real that you need to have something ready to go. So, right. Yeah. But it's cool. I'm stoked about it. I can't wait to, uh, you know, to actually gig with it. Okay, I'll let you know when that happens. Yeah, let us report back. I shall. Yeah, man. Hey, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, an, a quest I'm on down here. Okay. So, so I had said on the show that I'm not interested in putting together a band down here. And I, I don't think I'm interested in putting together a band. But, you know, it's kind of an interesting how the line moves a little bit. So like I said, I'm, I've been a cover guy. Right. But now, somewhat largely driven by a desire to see if I can do it, but also driven because down here, there's a pretty good original music scene. So the stars are lining up and it's encouraging me to explore this, uh, that there's, there's, there's work reasons. Like I can get booked with original music and and explore different ways to, to be booked. Um, and you know, also cause creatively I want to do it, but so my line moved a little bit. And so I'm not looking to put together an, uh, an electric band, but I am now thinking about putting together, a group that's kind of similar to what I have up at the coffee house up there. So, you know, again, I've used some house rockers on that thing, but I've also just played with some guys who I like or friends who I just want to play with. And it's a pretty casual thing. It's, it's kind of a, a, I send out a a song list. It mostly stays the same. Maybe once a month, I might send out a couple songs, but you show up, you know, be prepared, big ears and let's play. And that format works pretty well. I would say it's, and again, these songs are not, open heart surgery, you know, they're, sure. they're, they're, and so to me, it's kind of the concept of like jazz gigs where guys show up and you know, the basic forms and you know, the basic changes and you play. And, um, and that's kind of what it is. It's on me to be prepared to, you know, not be too loose about it, know my words, you know, that type of thing. So, um, uh, I'm thinking about doing that down here. And in the process of doing that, I wanted to share a little bit about my, my thinking of this. And, and it goes like this. So uh, I know a guy up in the Bay Area who um, calls A-list players and uh, he gets a different one most times and they show up and to varying degrees, there's no loyalty, you know, there's no connection. The notes are right. You know, the feel might not be 
great all the time, but again, it gets done. Sure. The, the thought about doing that is I've kind of figured out who the A-list players are down here uh, is in my mind. The interesting thing is that it's a smaller market, so that pool of A-list players, known quantities, they get about, I'll pick a number, 80% of the gigs down here, right? Like on any mm. given night. if you know, So so it's a smaller number of people because uh, you know the population is so much smaller. But the same guys keep showing up, as I can see, in many, many, many gigs. Sure. My view of the world is often, um, I would rather find the guys who... I clicks clicks concern me and clicks and clicks worry me, right? I don't feel comfortable with that. And to, click, to my own clicks with a Q, not a CKS. Yes, well, both of them actually. But, uh, <laughs> well, we're talking about the Q here. Ways. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you know, my thought is down here. I'd rather find the guys who are got the chops, good players, but they're not the ones putting themselves out. They want to be connected to something. There, there's a little bit more attention and loyalty because, you know, someone's going to come along and make their life easier by, you know, giving them something, somewhere to play. Uh, so I, I just wanted to share that with you and see, you know, I, I'm guessing you've probably been in both ways because you've moved into different areas. Yeah. You're a very good player. You kind of size up, you know, I, and I don't know in Austin, whether there were more drummers than there needed to be, or whether in Connecticut, there were more drummers than needed to be. But, you know, my, my thought right now is Craigslist is tough because you got to go through so much noise to get some signal right it's just I, I just find it's like you get a lot of people you know it's like it's like online dating you know their, their picture doesn't always match there <laughs> no that's <laughs> a great way of putting it I, like i've i've had good luck with craigslist a few times in my life i'm trying to think what did i use when i found keith and the responders in connecticut i would i want to say craigslist but i mean we're talking 20 years ago I don't know that I guess Craigslist was a thing back then. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I guess. So I guess it was Craigslist. So that's how I found them. That's how I found Uptown. Uh, that's how I found the this fantastic set of Mapex drums that I only paid 700 bucks for. Um, you, you know, it can be great. However, you need to be you need to figure out how to sift through Craigslist. And and the way I and I've used. um yeah, I guess it's always been Craigslist. Yeah, because that's how I found knockoff too when I got up here to New Hampshire. It was Craigslist. Um, I they have um a email subscription that you can get when things that match your search filters get posted. And so I've gone in and created subscriptions of like, and you can get somewhat granular with it. You can say, like looking, you know, drummer within, you know, 50 miles of X and, and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I'll get posts like people looking for a guitar player because the ad says I'm a drummer and I have a keyboard player and we're looking for a guitar player. Right. And so I get that, but it's easy to just delete those. And if I have them, uh, I have my email filters set up so that my Craigslist stuff goes into a separate box. So it's not really pushed at me, but it is these filters. I don't have to go to the website either. And just like, deal with the 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 river of crap that's out there. I'm sure I miss things, of course, but I, you know, I have an email box where I can just go through and very quickly like click 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 like you know delete 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 wait hang on uh delete you know <laughs> and just very quickly go through and and find things either be it drums that I'm looking for or you know someone to to hire me you know for a gig. So Craigslist can be okay. Um but you need to approach it very carefully and with the knowledge that even with all those filters, you know, 85, 90% of it, 95% of it maybe is just going to be crap. And, yeah. and, you know, you hit the delete button, you move on. But the way I've organized it, I can go through a day's worth of Craigslist posts in 30 seconds. I can go through a week's list of Craigslist posts in probably 90 seconds, right? Like it's yeah. super fast. So I, and, and that's, that's a handy way. That's the only way I f that find to make it valuable. But to your point, yeah, in Austin, to answer your question, not that it really matters in Austin, uh, drummers could, and I think still can sort of write their own ticket. There's not enough drummers to match all the bands that are down there, which is great. In Connecticut, cool. it's exactly the opposite. You got to be able to play. And even then you will not get gigs because there's better people that already have a reputation or already know people, the whole networking thing is key. And the networking thing is key everywhere, but in Austin, people were willing to overlook the fact that they had no freaking clue who I was 
because they needed a drummer, you know, yeah. warm body with drums shows up and can hit them and play in time. Speaking of clicks. And it was like, oh, you're hired. It was like, oh, let's talk first. You know, so I yeah. had to be a little more. But like you said, it's like dating. You know, you, one side is more desperate than the other. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's just how it's going to be. You know, it's rarely is it equal. And so you so, got to suss people out. Yeah. 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 So so I'll continue with this. So, you know, Craigslist, one option, but, you know, I'm, I'm weary of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I spent a long part of my life having to do networking in, in my day job stuff. So I'm really comfortable saying, hey. Um, you know, you look like somebody that I might want to have a connection with. You want to go grab a, a beer? You want to go grab some lunch? And I, so I've been doing that kind of since I'm down here just to get to know people, just to start to create a network. You know, originally I did it just to get ideas about where I should look for gigs. And, you know, just, you know, if you're out there, it's better than not being out there, right? So sure. so just, you know, doing that type of thing. So I, I'll go to lunch with a couple of people. And again, it, it's a weird thing for a lot of musicians because they'll be like, what? You want to you want to do what? You know, who are you? <laughs> you right? want to date me? What's happening here? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, I'll be like, hey, I'm a new musician in the area. You know, I'm, you know, just trying to make some contacts. You know, you want to get together and that type of thing. And again, some people are really weird. And I'm going to be really cautious about overgeneralizing here because I will say again, I had some have some good friends that are up in the Bay Area that I would consider A-listers, right? Sure. And and uh, that I that I've played with, and I will sometimes not call them for something, and will cause odd, hard, surprised, hard feelings, um, because my gut is like, there's well, there's other people who really, w you know, they can play, and they really would love a gig, and they really are thankful for a gig, and and you know that type of that type of connection is meaningful to me. So yep. I will, you know, try and pull other people into my orbit every once in a while, you know, that type of thing. Now, I don't have an orbit down here. Of course. Right? So Yeah, you're trying to so, get into other people's orbit right now. Well, yeah. Or, or actually, what I'm more I'm trying to do, I'm trying to create my orbit. So that's what I'm saying. That's it's like fair. I can, you know, and, and, and in the music world, your orbit is created if you have gigs. Gigs are the currency that, that you need, right? Generally speaking, that is true. Yes. And then <laughs> right right next to that is can you play, right? Because people want to play with people who can play. Yep. So, you know. I, but, but you're I, right that that's the order. In most places, it's do you have gigs? And, and then second to that, important but not equally so, is can you play? Because right. you'll get, if you even if you can't play as well, if you got gigs, you get people to play with you. So that's, yep. 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 Fair. So anyway, um, I am networking with people, but I'm I'm searching for those hidden gems. Guys who have chops are good. Even they might even be a bedroom guy, you know. But and but the best is a guy who you know has has some experience, has no interest in playing the click game, yeah. Um, and is there, and you rediscover this person, and they're you know they've got. I always say that one of the biggest things about success is having people that are on the same page about things. And, the, and even the A-lister equation works out okay when everybody fully understands, appreciates, ex tacitly accepts what the nature of the relationship is. I'm probably not going to get you next time. Uh, you may charge me something else next time. You know, that type of thing. Sure. Um, you know, and th that's that's kind of the way jazz gigs are, right? Like, like you know, you get your fake book, you show up. Yep. <laughs> you know, and, and you sit in and if you play your butt off and there's a little bit of chemistry or there's a little bit of, you know, to me, I, I'd, I'd like a little bit of, of uh, I would prefer to have guys that I, that I can, that will usually be available. Right. Yeah. It's a little, oh, there's you know, a, at this point in time. Yeah. And again, this is a, this is a non-rehearsal thing. So this is like, you know, maybe we'll get together one time, but we're not going to get together every week and, you know, go over every fine tune. We're not playing rush material. We're playing, yeah. you know. Beatles stuff and, you know, stuff, you know, stuff that stuff that I think can be brought into a gig and everybody, you know, be fine. It's pretty safe. Right. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not heavy, uh, uh, vocal rehearsals or that type of stuff. If I find someone who can sing, I might say, let's get together and just with an acoustic guitar, let's see what we can do. But again, this is the equivalent of a, you know, it's a rock, pickup, fake, pickup gig rig, rock, fake book stuff. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and that's cool because I'm trying to build my own orbit and trying to build my own name and, you know, that type of thing. And, um, you know, I have full confidence. And this works. You know, it's worked for me in somewhere else. So I believe it can work for me here. Sure. But I just thought I'd share those thoughts that, you know, there's A-listers. You get, you know what you're getting. They're pros. They show up. You know, if they're really pros, they show up prepared, you know, and they do their thing. Um, and if they're, you know, less than pros – uh, they show up and they can play, but they probably aren't as prepared as as you would like a pro to be. That's right. And I'm I'm looking for a guy who you know, yeah, you know, this is cool. You know, I don't have to give up 
a ton of time, you know, for endless rehearsals. I, um, I'm good enough to know the stuff. If you're good enough to know the stuff, I'll show up prepared and we'll play. And uh, and it's an interesting formula. So I just wanted to share that again. I don't want to I don't want to castigate all A-listers. They're A-listers for a reason, right? You know, they they earn a place in their particular communities or musical worlds, and you know, they're good players, and you know, they're con- con- connected and that type of thing. I met a drummer. We've been talking about my friend Mel, yeah. who you've been nice enough to, you know, give him a, an online lesson and kind of give him some encouragement, which is awesome, by the way. But um, it's a blast. Went to see- I, I love doing it. Yeah, it was awesome. Yep. And he's he's very appreciative. I went and saw Mel and I after Thanksgiving. We went to see Mel's teacher's band. Ah. Super duper player, like really good player. And the band he was playing with, I would say, is kind of his second band. He he plays with a guy who's who has an original band, super interesting group called the Travis Larson Band. Travis is a longtime well-known guitar player. It's kind of instrumental prog prog type stuff. And Dale, this drummer, is really good. I mean, really good. And Mel said, I want you to meet him. So we went and checked him out. And then Dale was cool enough. We went to dinner afterwards, got to know each other a little bit. And I told Dale what I do. And, and you know, he was really cool about it. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty busy. At, but yeah, you know, a pickup gig's a pickup gig. And if it's a good one, I would, I would consider doing it. And I said, hey, can you connect me with other people? Who do you refer gigs to when you can't take them? And so that's one method that I have for looking for drummers to kind of you know, build my, and he's also a teacher. So he knows, you know, yeah, he knows a lot. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So again, there's that. And then, you know, this coming week, uh, there's a guy here who I really like a local musician who's great chops, you know, and I, and he was one of those guys I reached out and said, Hey, I'm a, I'm a new in town and this is what I do here. You know, here's my Facebook page about what I do. I'm just trying to meet people. Would you, would you like to go out for a sandwich? And, and he said, yeah. And then he has a reputation of being a really nice guy. So I try to collect nice people, you know, I would do for others as what I'm asking to be done for me, right? I would right. people or connect people, that type of thing. So I'm looking for those types of people. So yeah, those are just little thoughts. A-listers versus, you know, the hidden gems in any musical community. And they're out there. They're always out there. The A-listers are not the only guys in any particular market. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 And, and that, it's interesting. I, I, I mean, I suppose around here... There, I mean, that concept exists everywhere for sure. I, it was it was super evident when I lived in Austin um, th- that there was you know this group, this handful, maybe ten, right, that were a listers, especially uh, guitar players who played with everybody. It, you know, they were just the people on every gig, but yeah. they weren't. You know, they if if. If the stars aligned properly, they were like officially part of one band and then, but, but they, you know, they would sometimes even have to sub that out and stuff. So like, I, yeah. I, and, and I've, I've tried to be really, I enjoy playing music with multiple people. I think it's really valuable uh, in a lot of ways. A, it keeps the, the gigs plentiful, but, it, but more than that, it, at least for me is the experience of playing with people that have different ideas and, and different uh, you know, m- music and, and different talent levels and like all of there's stunt, there's things to be learned from everyone. And I'd love to just keep learning and, and, you know, I try to be like a sponge with, with that. And so I really do like playing with different people all the time, but I, I don't want to be so spread thin that I can't be a part of a band because that's my favorite thing. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. So I totally get what you're saying here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, right? And it, it's, it's more difficult when no one is, when no one is offering full time employment. I, I wanted to state that carefully. I, I didn't want to say when no one is playing music full time because that is not necessarily true. You can, in fact, oftentimes, the people who are playing music full time are those A-listers. And part of the reason that they play in so many projects is because they need to in order to, you know, make their monthly nut. But when the people who employ them or work with them are not offering full time employment, that's what creates this kind of scenario in in some cases. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I don't have any answers here, though. I can just ramble mm-hmm. about it. So No, that's what we do. I mean, it, it, again, it's different for everybody. And the guy I know up in the Bay Area, you, you know, he just calls an A-lister and 
and uh, sets up shop. It's never completely tight. It's always functional, though, and you know, yep. to the average person listening, it's it's more than functional. It's all about the guy. And um, well, it's you know, can you one, play and can you perform, <clears throat> right? Like, yeah. I mean, for for the scenario you're talking about, that's what you need is somebody who can who gels both musically and you know from a performance standpoint. Like, you know, can that person deliver on the gig the way I need them to deliver? You know, if it's a lead guitar player, all right. Well, you know, when you're going to take a solo. Don't stand with your back to the crowd. Doesn't matter how great you are, right? Like go right. and perform because that's part of this process here. It, you know, those things matter. So yeah. <sighs> Fun stuff. Yep. I don't have anything else. Do you have anything else? No, that's good. We're going to take next week off for Christmas, right? Oh, I like that idea. Let's do that. Yeah. All right. All right. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. Thanks yeah. for listening. And another we're coming up on the end of another year, aren't we? February is the beginning. Yeah, it's of February. Close, right? I, I have the thing in my calendar somewhere, but uh, yeah, I think it's a gig uh, anniversary. Let me look at this. Uh, no, I can't find it. There it is. February 19th will be it. Yeah. And that oh. will be, uh, that will seven. be seven years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. That, it doesn't seem like seven years. Onward Amazing. we go. Onward we go. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. As uh, as we said, as we always say, enjoy. Send us your thoughts. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. What's the other thing we say? I, I just forget. Always be performing and happy holidays. There we go.